Hi everybody, it's At Skating PJ here with uh, Skate Ontario TV, as we're calling it, because <laughs> Facebook Live is not working for us today. Yeah. I know. Anyway, Elvis Stoiko, Stoiko, I am thrilled to have you here. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what you're doing these days? Yeah, um, well, getting ready for the Rock the Rink tour with Tessa and Scott and the, and the gang. Uh, we're heading out in a couple weeks for rehearsals in Abbotsford, and then we move across Canada. Uh, 28 shows in total. Wow. Um, yeah, it's going to be fun. We had a great time last year with the Thank You Canada Tour. So with this tour, it's kind of like Thank You Canada 2.0 or 3.0 or yep. 5.0 or 10, however you want to call it. Um, so we're really pumped. We have some international skaters uh, along with us. Uh, Carolina Costner is, is one of them, which is awesome. So um, we've got a great group. Jeremy Abbott from the States. Um, we have the Russian pair team. I can't pronounce her name, so I'm not going to. Just go to the website and you'll find out who they are. Um, and uh, yeah, no, we're just we're excited about that and, and busy with uh, a ton of auditions for acting. Um, uh, we're shooting some stuff earlier this year, which is going to be aired. Uh, Hudson and Rex is coming out this I've been fall. watching the commercial. Yeah, yeah. So people are like, hey, I saw you on Hudson and Rex. Yeah, it's coming out. So I'm really excited about that as well. And, and uh, that's been kind of my main focus over the summer when I had a, a break. Um, yeah, and that's what's happening. We have our last season, uh, my wife and I have with Bush Gardens. Um, I know they, they're thinking about extending it. Originally, it was a three-year contract. It became a five-year contract because they, they liked the show so much, which was great. And that's in not in Florida. It's actually in Williamsburg, Virginia. So if people say, hey, down in Florida. No, it's in, it's in Williamsburg, Virginia. It's a great show at the park. And, and we're there for about 65 shows in seven weeks. Wow. So that's, uh, that's kind of a, it's a fun contract. It's tough, but it's a fun contract. Do you know what's funny? Um, as I was looking through sort of our comments on Facebook before in preparation for our non-Facebook Live, <laughs> <laughs> um, one of, one of the, your fans was wondering about when you were coming back to Busch Gardens. So yeah. if you're going to want to see Elvis and Gladys, yeah. This is the year. Yeah, yeah, oh. we'll, yeah. This this is the one. We're last year we started before American Thanksgiving. Uh, they wanted to add more shows. This year they're going back to the original schedule. So I think it starts on the weekend of the twenty third, twenty second of November. That's the opening weekend. Yeah. And then um, yeah, and then we continue right on through till like January first. You are what I like to refer to as a Renaissance man. You are somebody who has all kinds of different skills, all kinds of different interests. Your uh, capacity for for knowledge your thirst for knowledge your curiosity is kind of off the charts to what do you attribute that I think a lot of it has to do with always searching again it goes to the, we've talked about it earlier the hunter and the interceptor those are the two the two types of people that we are in in martial arts we we, we separate into those two categories uh, yeah sometimes I can be an interceptor Sometimes people that are interceptors can be hunters. It just it depends. But when it comes down to it, to our core, our DNA, our instinct, it's one of those two. For me, I'm always searching, always looking, always um, trying to gain knowledge more about myself. And I always like to test myself in certain conditions. So if there's something that pops into my head that I find interesting or would like to do, um, I want to explore it and figure it out. It, there's, there, there's a reason for it. Um, and yeah, there's this will go right into the one of the questions we had earlier. Yeah. Um, you know about the, the the little girl that was doing axles and was afraid to actually do the axle yet. Her and her friends. mom wanted to know if there's a technique to access the warrior. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's it's not like it's something that doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. So for example, if I'm afraid for the first time, I go into an acting class and they're all new students or people they may know each other and I don't know anyone. I will make push myself to be the first to do the scene okay because what that does is it attacks the fear and the only way to deal with fear is to put yourself in that situation and deal with it um, for me it's about the actual goal at the end how, how bad do I want to be successful as an actor well if I'm nervous in that situation I can't be so I have to overcome it so what happens is the goal becomes stronger than the fear the okay. want of the goal is stronger than the fear, and if the fear is really high, you've got to push yourself towards that goal. And if your goal is not strong enough, then the fear is going to take over and you won't be able to follow through. Some people say that the fear, uh, that feeling of butterflies, that feeling of, of nervousness as you're about to do something that is challenging, that that is actually a good thing, that otherwise you quote unquote don't care. What do you say to that? 
Um, well, what that is, um, that's more adrenaline. The adrenaline is that, that, that response where you're excited to go do something, yeah, you're anxious, you're worried about failing, but on the other hand, you are um, excited to do this event, and that's, that's a normal reaction for everyone that, if it's important to you, it spikes up and it goes. Now, the intensity of it is where it kicks in. When, when fear starts to take over, like there's an anticipation and there's a certain level of it, there's different levels of it. And if it becomes too much, then you have to bring it down because then it takes over. Now, in, in like for example, in, in competition or in practices, there's that fear of making a mistake. What that does is you, you fear becomes a friend for me because what it, it, it's like a magnifying glass. It's like you make a mistake on a regular practice, then you go into competition, you make the same mistake, but it seems bigger now. Okay. Because your lens is now magnified ten or a hundred times, because now everything's around you. Now you're now you're on the spot. So, usually during a week of competition, I always become a better skater, because you're you're training at a very high level. That's was when when Tess and Scott were training with Marilyn Charlie. Okay. I'm not saying that fear every day, but they had, they had anxiety every day to be one up. That's why they pushed sure. each other. It's a very tough environment to train in every single day because we can't mean that maintain that our adrenal glands will get totally taxed and then we're done yeah okay because that because your adrenals are firing like crazy um, but that that's why we can only do it for for so long that's why in those situations they were like okay now we got to go train by ourselves because you can't always have that pressure every single day it's like being in a stressful job every day of your life and then all of a sudden boom you're done yeah you can't handle it anymore the, the body will just give out because it needs to recharge and you know that's why you don't compete every single weekend. Um, now that's why when we do shows, yeah, we do get excited. It may not be as high as competition, but we do get that high, and we need to have that re that recharge, um, you know, all the way through. So going back to the original question, that intensity of the goal has to be stronger than the fear that's there. So there's that spike of fear, but the want of the goal has to be stronger. And the warrior is the energy firing through the fear towards the goal and going past it to get to the goal. And it, they have to find it within them. They have to know and go, you know what, this is, uh, this is more important than my fear blocking me. And if they can't get through it, um, there's one way, like through martial arts, I was able to, to harness that warrior instinct. I had it within me the whole time, like it was very raw. And my instructor, Glenn Doyle, worked on it with me to, to hone it and zone in and know what it was to understand what actually that is, to fire through that willpower. And um, through techniques, um, punching and kicking, people say, oh, you know, what, you know, martial arts is about fighting. It's not. It's about getting rid of our own fears and egos and understanding, give us confidence about ourselves. Once you do that, then you feel that warrior start to, to come out. When we, we have that feeling of knowing our body and how to handle our body, how to move our body, and be confident within our skin, that's what martial arts teaches you. Okay. Okay? So yep. explaining that, that's when you translate Kung Fu, it actually means just basically hard work. Hard work, and I look at it as breaking away the unessentials of what we don't need to understand who we are as a person, that person that is core to you, to know who you are. So is it acceptable, um, in the case of this parent asking about their 13-year-old, is it acceptable to know yourself as a 13-year-old to say, I don't wanna jump? I don't want to fall down, mm -hmm. um, and have it not be labeled as fear, but simply a choice. Or, mm -hmm. or where where do you sit with that? It, it's their choice. Like at, at younger ages, usually you know kids don't have that much fear when they're younger. Yeah. You know you, that's why we learn a lot of the gymnastics and all the really high high risk stuff is at a younger age. Because later on, as we get older, we know the consequences, so we have more stuff rolling around in our brains. Yeah. When you're younger, you don't. So you just go for it. Now, if you do have some of it and you're worried about getting hurt, then maybe if they're interested in going into something else, that's fine too. Or they're going into another avenue in, in skating. And I've seen it. I've seen kids that just, they don't want to, you know, I've worked with skaters like that. They're really good, but they have the fear of getting hurt. Right. And unfortunately, in our sport, we do get hurt. It's just part and parcel. That's that's the risk part of being in sport. Yeah, That's for what sure. a sport is, actually is the, the risk of getting hurt. There's a certain, um, our sense of mortality within it 
is what pushes us because that's where sport really comes from. There's the hunting, putting ourselves out there. That was the, the hunter-gatherer type of thing way back, you know. And then eventually sport came out and, 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 and replaced that. Um, but it's that part of us that is that self-preservation. And if you have that block, the warrior has to kick through, but then you have to go, you know, is it, is it really worth it? It's, it's, it's what's worth to you. Like when I, I was working on, I remember this very clearly, I was working on double axles. That was, that was 13, um, 12, 13 years old. And I kept falling outside the circle, landing on my hip and I hurt my hip so bad. There's a bursa sac that's inside yeah. the, the hip bone uh, and where the muscle is and I hit it. And if I would have hit it again, I could have burst that sac. Hmm. And it was so bad I couldn't walk. Um, well, one of the attributes I have is I have a high pain threshold which is, can be a good thing and not so good thing. And tenacity. And the tenacity. So yeah, I was afraid of hurt, hitting myself and I was afraid of pain, but the double axle meant more to me than anything else. So I pushed through and eventually got it. But it was hard, but that drive, that warrior instinct was already there and I hadn't even started. I, I started martial arts when I was 10, but I didn't start doing Kung Fu till I was about 16. That tenacity was there but it was honed later to understand what it was. And again, I always, I always, when people ask me what's one of the most important things about sport or even in life, I always see that scene in the in Matrix when Neil walks through and sees the um, the Oracle, and she says, "Look behind you." And in Latin, it says, um, "You know, know thyself." It's to know thyself, know your strengths, know your weaknesses, understand who you are, and. Only in fear will you really know who you are. Yeah, that's true. Because you're know tested. What, you're testing, you know what you want, and you'll know how far you're willing to push yourself. So the warrior, um, and then there's the performer. Yes. So how does the performer line up with the warrior? Yeah, that's, the, that's a really good question. Um, and we brought, you brought up a great, it was a great article from Japan. Uh, well, no, we've got some Japanese fans who are huge fans of yours. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they wanted to talk about was... Um, uh, sort of the comparison between you and Yuzuru Hanyu. Mm -hmm. So your article was translated into Japanese and Japanese fans um, sort of ate it up and loved that whole idea of the warrior versus uh, the performer. Mm -hmm. So you read the question, if you want to just paraphrase it, about yeah. Yuzuru Hanyu. Hanyu has the perfect balance. Like that, he goes out there as the warrior and then performs. Um, it doesn't have the performer attitude first. If you have the performer attitude first, you will get destroyed in competition, hands down. Okay. I've seen it all the time. Because, and like he was saying in an article I just read, which was great, people ask, you know, go out there and rela relax into it. You, you can't relax into it. The only time I relax in anything is when I relax on my bed and watch television. That's yeah. when I'm relaxed. Yeah. Being calm, that's what you want to be. So this whole idea of letting go is not what what it doesn't serve skaters or um, sorry competitors very well tell me why and Han you again says this is general and I agree with a hundred percent it's generalized what happens is when you let go you try to let go of the worry and you want to trust your training that's what letting go means you've done all this training you're skating well now don't worry about the training let go of the training but don't let go of the moment. Don't okay. just let go of everything you've done. You've got to push through and do it. Usually people that have never been there or have been in that type of situation say things like that because they don't know what else to say. Yeah. They try to calm the try to calm their skater. But the skater's job is to calm themselves but not be relaxed. Be calm, but underneath there's all this turmoil. There hasn't been, I've had moments of skating, I call them white moments, where they have this, where it, everything just happens, it happens through me, but I didn't let go in, in order for it, that to happen. I stayed within my zone, and some of, I, I've had those moments where I've skated, and I come off and I can't remember what I just did, because I was in the moment, every sure. step of the way, and it flowed through me. And I was aware of everything that was happening and I was adjusting as I was going, okay? But at the beginning, when it started out, I didn't just let go and it just happened. 
doesn't doesn't work that way skating doesn't happen to you and that's part of the problem with people letting go is that they assume somehow that skating is outside of them mm -hmm. and that it's going to be superimposed on top of them if they just let go and let it happen mm -hmm. versus taking the reins yeah you have to and you have to fight like at the beginning sometimes to get it going you have to find it's like it's like double dutch it's like stepping in a double dutch yeah okay you, Which I can't do. Thanks for bringing it up. It's, it's, a, it's a bugger. And I use this. I use this in a, my acting class with, uh, with one of my coaches, and we were talking about it. It's finding that balance of when to jump in. If you jump too fast, jump too hard, not not quick enough, and then you get in and you you're too slow. You've yep. got to jump in and bang, and then you hit it. Yeah. And you're in it. It's the same thing when you first begin the program or start. You want to start in that timing because. You have all this turmoil happening inside. You have all this energy of want and expectation within you. Um, thoughts of other things going on. All this craziness is happening. Okay, this energy pulls you off, pulls you off your center where you normally are when you train. Okay? Yeah. And when that pulls you away, you've got to use your energy to pull you back. And as you do that, you also have to stay calm. And that's a very hard thing to do. Yeah, for but sure. But you can only do that as a warrior. And just as the performer, you're just too loose, kind of like not well, quite as Well, what happens focused. is the performer attitude, they tend to go with the feeling that they're in at the moment. Okay. Okay? And that's great if you're not doing anything highly skilled to risk. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Okay, my leg didn't go as high. Oh, I won't get as much of a mark if my leg didn't go as high. Well, if I'm off slightly on a takeoff on a quad, I'm going down, boom, marks are done. Yeah. Okay. Um, Tightrope walking, mountain climbing, uh, traveling at 225 miles an hour in an F1 car. Okay. That moment of being slightly off, there is, <laughs> you're in trouble. Yeah. Okay, that, that's the mortality part. That's the risk part. And the warrior has to be on it right then or that's it. Okay? Performer tends to let go into the moment, okay? And that's fine with that part of the energy. They're performing and the, the thought of, okay, they wanna make it perfect, that perfectionist part, that's part of the warrior part. When it becomes a performer part, it's, they let go almost too much and they try to be, you're in the moment, but when you let go completely, they let go of that lineup. There's almost like a tension that there has to be. There has to be an exactly like that. There's, yep. a, there's a, a tension. If it's too tight, it isn't good. So you want to relax it just a little bit. But what happens is when they let go, they let go of the whole elastic. Yeah. And, and then, then it, everything just, and they don't know what to do. They don't know where to focus this, to zone in. They get kind of, and I've seen that at a lot of competitors, they step out and they're, they're, they look like a deer caught in the headlights. They don't know where to zone in. Because yeah. the feeling is there that anxiety and all that energy has taken them over. And the, you, I can tell they're just lost. They don't know where to place themselves. The warrior goes, no, I need to be here and only here in order for me to channel and go through. It's like taking that energy and putting it through a straw. Mm -hmm. And you've got to focus it through the straw because it wants to go wide on you. The energy wants to disperse and pull you out of your center because it gets too big. And the performer wants to be out there. They yeah. want to be, but the problem is you've got to bring it back in first. Bring that energy in. Have that energy, because it's like it's like herding cats. You can't hold the energy and control it completely, but you have to just have enough of it to move. So you have to be in this space of where you're you're kind you're working with it instead of trying to control it. But letting it go completely, you're you're in trouble. You're at the you're at the mercy of the of the energies you're now a leaf blowing in the wind and that's and that's the same thing in life and I relate that to life in general so give me a situation or maybe there never was one were you ever at that starting position getting ready to compete afraid was there ever a time like a, a moment a time a competition or were you always already focused inward ready to go there there were moments um, because young, younger skaters are going to be watching this and they're going to say that they're terrified. Like even as an announcer, I oh, get yeah. to the Olympics and I go, why did I ever say yes? I don't want to be here yeah, yeah, no, it, it, until yeah. the microphone goes on and then I'm fine. But that last couple of minutes, it's like, 
what was I thinking? So it, it's, it's not fear as much as what was I thinking? Yeah, they're, they're all, all, the, all four of my Olympic games, they all had different energies to them. Sure. Um, Little Hammer, I was, I was still, there was no, I was no fear. I was calm, but I had lots of excitement. I was like, you know, I was like, wow, this is awesome. But I was so calm, I was zoned in, but all the stuff underneath was bubbling and their energy. And I'm like, I'm calm because this is this energy I need this anxiety I need to, to bring the magic moment. Sure. And I had that magic moment there. Same thing in, in Albertville. I had the same thing, that spike, and I was walking in the back, and it was all happening, and I was the same. I did a lot of self-talk, and, and Peter Jensen was there too. We were talking with Doug at the time. This was way back. And uh, we were- Doug Lee, your coach. Doug Lee, my coach, yes. And, uh, and Peter Jensen was our sports psychologist at the time. Um, he worked Canadian team skating and, and um, other sports as well. and. Uh, we were just talking in the back and then I would just talk to myself and I would talk with them just to get zoned in. 98. Um, that was a special one. That was a special one. Um, yeah, I was I was pretty terrified before I went out because I didn't know how my body was going to react. Sure, and you were injured. And I was injured and that, that's what I was afraid. I didn't know what was going to happen. Expectation, there's a lot of things there. But my want of succeeding to win over overrided was the override for that. Yeah. You know, I burn out like it was I everything was firing at like Mach 50. But it was it was uh, that moment you'll even see if you go back and watch the short and the long program, you'll see it in my eye like I'm I'm driving all my energy through because it's ready to like my whole body wants to let go. Yeah. Like it wants to completely let go and I'm just holding everything together so it doesn't. People need to watch the end of your free program because at the end of your free program, you did let go. Like at the, what, when the finishing pose was finished and the music stopped, there's your, the pain on your face, the register of the, um, of the I'm really hurt. We didn't know that. None yeah. of us knew that by looking at you. And I remember you telling me that once you re-injured yourself in Nagano, you started thinking, how many more jumps do I have to do till this is done? You counted backwards. Okay, how many do I need for the short? How many do I need for the free? Yeah. And you also tore your abdomen in your triple axle in the free? The, the first triple axle, triple toe combo, the bottom, because I was using other muscles to compensate, yeah. um, I ended up tearing the lower abdomen, the landing, and then just kept going, and then going into the set, second triple axle, if I fell, I probably wouldn't have gone up. So I was just hanging on. So, I, but I, and again, hanging on, holding, holding everything together. And then at the end, I had no choice. My body knew that I had set the parameter. My body went, okay, fine. We're gonna do a short, we're gonna do a long. And after that four and a half minutes, you're done. <laughs> I'll and never it, and forget it. Let go, and I, and it yep. let go of everything. Like I let go, there was, it was, it was a lot deeper than simply my body let go of the moment. No, no, no. It was, you had survived a test that was almost superhuman. The, the emotional and spiritual were yep. all linked that just completely let go. And it wasn't two years later that I went through to understand what I, the damage that I actually went through to, to hold that tight. It's like lifting a heavy weight and the muscle rips, you know, there's, you know, taking on more than you can bear until after the adrenaline makes you do it and then after you're like uh oh what have I done is there one medal in your entire career that means more than any other I can tell you Tessa and Scott's favorite medal that they shared with me yeah I've there's so many different moments because metal metal yeah yeah well that's what I mean there's so many different okay, moments sure um I obviously Nagano is a huge one for me. absolutely you know that's got a that's got a gold trim on that that silver but um, do you know what Tess and Scott's was their junior Canadian title yeah I could that's that's cool yeah that's I really know cool. yeah. you know with all of the Olympic accolades and the two gold medals and the silver and the other team gold I'm missing one and team silver I'm probably missing another one but anyway um, I said what I said to Scott I think what's your favorite medal and he said junior Canadian title so they all I'd, mean something different. I'd have to say, I'd have to say, out of all of them, probably Sudbury Nationals, my first Nationals as a senior uh, in Sudbury in 1990. And what was special about that? Well, you got to go to Worlds. I saw you at That's Worlds in 1990 in Halifax. First Worlds. It was because I made a pact with myself the year before. I remember not making to Nationals, and I was so pissed. 
I missed it by one at divisionals, and I vowed that I would, wasn't that I would place second or be on the podium, but I would make a mark and be and be known, and that was my big thing, and I was gonna do it, and I was gonna get the triple axle, and the, and that was, and it was funny, that was the year I met uh, my instructor, Glenn. Yeah. And that year we trained, and when I made that commitment, I, met, I came back from divisionals, in eighty nine. In, in eighty nine. Uh, and thirty years ago, by the way. De- yeah, it was December of eighty. It was December of eighty eight. Yep. To eighty nine, and I came home. I didn't take a day off. I went right to the rink the next day and I trained for the next year. And I perp- and I watched Canadians. I remember Kurt winning. You know, Brian was out. Kurt was now, and I watched all the competitors. And I wa- and I forced myself to watch it and go. I am going to be ready for next year and I'm going to make my mark. How that is, I don't know, but I'm going to make my mark. And I and that was and I didn't realize how big a mark I would make all the way through that, you know, I went from in Junior Worlds wasn't great that season, but I was it was just it was just ready to peak. It was all that work hadn't been shown yet. And then at divisionals going 89 to 90, that's when it showed and then nationals and worlds. So it was it would just it went up, but it was that Canadians that was really magical to me because I felt all that energy and that excitement and everything but I was very calm so if you have first of all um, I want you to tell me something that surprised you about yourself in being the skater in residence and the two blogs that you wrote because when you and I first talked about you doing it you said what what should I write about and I said you can write about anything you want mm-hmm. so how easy were those blogs to write because they sounded just like quintessential Elvis. They were great. They well, and people can find them on SkateOntario.org, the Skate Ontario U page, or on our Facebook page. I have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem. I, um, I take my time when I'm writing because I'm not a writer. I'm more of a speaker. Yeah. But I, um, I sat there and I just, I just meditated on. It. I just closed my eyes and went, what should I write? What do I feel? That's the time I let go. But I zoned in. <laughs> I didn't let go of the question. Yeah. I need to write something with impact. Something that comes from the heart, boom, and then it just came. So I close my eyes and I let it come to me, right? Boom. But again, that's, you're performing at that point. But you're also a warrior by that point because you are staying on task. Yeah, exactly. There's a task at hand that you've got to keep the line, but if you you lose the whole point, it's like, I don't know how many times I've been in an interview and I go off on a tangent and I got to bring myself back to the original (laughs) question. I've seen it, we see it now, I see it a lot now, uh, Graham Norton show or whatever, yeah. and he's got all the celebrities and people are talking. They ask a question and they start going off, and they really don't ask ask the question. Graham Norton's like, "You didn't answer the question that I just asked," because they <laughs> lose center of where they are. That's the performer. Okay. Doing that, <laughs> you know, they just go out and they just let go, and you know, you've got to stay on task. And I had my task, but I wanted the answer to come to me in the feeling, and then it just came to me, and I said, "You know what? I think I'm going to write about." this about meditation and what this actually means because I have a lot of friends asking me about it now they'll be like I you know what one of the doctors I work with said I should start meditating how do I meditate yep I said what do you want from it what do you what do you well, what are you know. looking for yeah, yeah what are you looking for I said just because someone tells you you should start meditating you've got to you've got to know why you got to understand what what's the internal aspect that's asking for this mm-hmm. you know and the, and just and spend time with that you know what i mean so that's how it how it came and i thought you know through meditation i use it i use it like i said i use it for manifestation and manifesting and creating and using that visualization i use a, like i said i use a lot of self talk yeah uh, i write a lot of stuff down i used to write words down and put them on the mirror you know certain phrases that are very simple um, that are all positive, not in the negative connotation. So it's like, never write down, I don't want this. Because the universe doesn't see, I don't. It doesn't see the negative side of it. It only sees the thing, the noun, the yep. verb, yep. right? It only sees that. So you need you need the positive connotation towards what you want. It also, it also circuits better in our brain. Um, and then the second one, that one I was sitting there and I was like, oh, I wonder what I should, and then it just popped into my head and I went, warrior versus performer because I remember talking about it in um, in a seminar I was doing the boy seminar that you did uh, for I, think I did that one yeah yep. that one um, and then there was another one I did and um, 
I brought it up because there's a lot of skaters that I that I have is like not all of them are at like elite level skating like for competitive stuff but are great skaters but maybe don't want to jump yeah but they love to perform so I said you're gonna have the warrior towards you know getting your audition spot you need the warrior or you're gonna get killed yeah because if you go performing you're gonna lose sense of where what your goal is right basically the warrior is attached to the end result okay right? and it's got to keep an eye on the ball right then you hold the thought to it and then focus on the first step getting there. Then you work on the steps. Sometimes the steps go back and then you move up. And I wanted to share that difference. And a lot of people, a lot of the kids clicked into that because I told them, I said, look, some of you want to go to Worlds. Some of you want to be world champions. Some of you don't actually want to go to Worlds. You actually want to perform and do shows because you enjoy performing. Yep. There's so many avenues out there on cruise ships, on Disney, on everywhere. There's all sorts of ways. Um, I have friends that, that travel all around the world and love what they do. You know, And then eventually, you know, some of them, maybe they just want to coach and want to get some more experience. Yep. You know, just physically doing it. So I didn't want to shoehorn them in to one thing. And the warrior versus performer works everywhere. Like I use it in acting all the time. You know, I'm in a moment, I'm working in a class situation one-on-one -on -one with my coach. And my warrior attitude is listening to him to try to get everything he's teaching me in that class. Yeah. Immediately in that one hour, I try to, to do the best of my ability there and not go, well, I'll do it later. No, 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 I'm, I'm now, this is the moment now to mm -hmm. do this. Right? Mm -hmm. I go into an audition. There's a bunch of guys ready to go in for the same part. Well, I better be in that warrior mode. Yeah, you're right, because you, you've got to stay on task. Yeah, and one of the things that my coach said, you know, I walk in, he goes, Elvis, just make sure you when you walk in, you always say, I belong. Because that's the thing, I'll get, you know. Skaters people, should do that, too. They belong. Yeah. You know, especially in, in this situation, because a lot of people say, oh, it must be easy for you to get an audition. Well, not exactly. They know a lot of people know me. Maybe gets my foot in the door. But the problem is, I also get doors shut because they see me only as a skater. Absolutely. So they won't. And in the acting world, they're like, "Well, what's he doing? He's a, he's an athlete. What's he doing in this realm as yeah. an artist?" And I'm like, "I belong." Yeah, and that helps. Okay, three quick key phrases for uh, skaters who are we're headed into the competitive season. Three quick key phrases or keywords for them that can be helpful as they're setting themselves up. Okay, um, for the season. Uh, for, or in, in a competition. In a competition. Um, and it's usually questions. Yeah. Because the questions they can ask themselves, because I won't know the, the person. So the question they ask, number one, what do I want? Okay, so what do I want in general? What do I want out of this competition? Yep, okay. What, okay. What am I afraid of? In general, is yep. the big thing. But what am I afraid of right now in this moment, in this competition? Why am I not feeling what, whatever this kind of weird vibration is? There'll be like the fear there. Why am I more fearful than normal? Okay, or maybe they're not. But usually at the beginning of the season, not everyone's on top of their yeah, game. Yeah, sure. So there could be, you want to get rid of those gremlins at the beginning of the season. You want to move them out. It couldn't, it might not even be related to skating. It could be a relationship situation that is affecting you emotionally. And as performers, which underlays under the warrior, that emotion is affected when we perform or when we're going into competition. Because the warrior uses emotion in order to get the job done. This is what I talk about Bruce Lee. Um, emotional content. You have to have emotional content. You have to have the want to do it. There's an emotional connection to do it. You're not just a zombie to walk through. So what do I want? What am I afraid of? You get those two super clear, there's nothing you can't, there's nothing that will stop you. If you can clear them and know what they are, okay, put those aside, then write the list of what are my strengths, embrace them, what are my weaknesses, okay, embrace them, know what they are and go, okay, I need to work on these, but don't fall into the trap of becoming the weakness right it's just an aspect just we acknowledge all, it it just acknowledge it okay i gotta yeah. work on this that's fine don't take it in personally or a shortcoming and then what that happens is the, the skater the athlete the person ends up 
harnessing, of, oh, this is who I am. You're not your weakness. That's just an, that's a small aspect of what's part of you. The weakness and the strength is what makes who you are. Sure. Right? And usually the weakness is there because you're holding, you could be holding too tight on something, um, not grabbing on something enough, not embracing your strength enough. And then if you, if you look at, the, if you, at your strengths and you embrace them more and you, you be there, actually a lot of those weaknesses fall to the wayside. Do you know what was one of my secret tricks with telling skaters uh, who were terrified of test day situation or competition or whatever? I'd look at them and I'd say, you know, you chose to be here. Nobody's making you do this. And as soon as they realize that this was actually a choice, you can see the shoulders come down a little bit. It doesn't mean that the anxiety completely goes away, but when they realize that they're in the driver's seat and that there was nobody here, you know, kicking them from behind and saying, you must, you must, you must, they were like, oh yeah, that's right. This is what I wanted to do. I'm smiling because that conversation I told you I had with Doug, Yeah. that was the exact conversation I had in 1992. You're kidding. But I told Doug. That, that you wanted to be there. Well, yeah, I said, hey, Doug, you know, I was walking in the back. We just came off our six-minute warm-up, walking in the back, and I'm like, you know, Doug, I have a choice to be here. And he looks at me, and he's like, yeah. And I'm like, I could, I could leave at any time. I actually don't have to go out there. He that's goes, exactly right. Yeah, that's right. And then he just paused, and you know, Doug, he's like, but you're <laughs> going to skate, right? And I'm like, of course I'm going to skate. It was really funny. That exact moment, that's why I'm laughing that yeah. you brought that up, because it's, they, they forget that you chose... It's powerful to know that you can stay or go. You belong, yep. and it's self empower. It's the self empowerment to be there. You're not forced, right? And that's and that's the big thing. And and taking ownership of of the of of the place, like of your of your moment, and know that yeah, your coach can take you as far as the boards, but when that door closes, you've got to know yourself because yep. they, they're not going to hold your hand. They're not, like. You wouldn't be able to like get out there with me and like physically okay now hold on to this and you know you have to be there and you have to hold on to it for yourself and and step into that role i want to know one last thing you represented central ontario we're now skate ontario what does it mean to come from this part of the country oh i've always i always loved skating for central ontario for ontario it was so um and sometimes I would you'd get to nationals and I'd done so many internationals and stuff that I'd forget that. And then I'd go, you know, go to nationals and be like, representing Central, Central Ontario. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's Remember, not just Canada. It's not just Canada. I'm representing Ontario, I'm representing Richmond Hill, where we're here in Richmond Hill. Um, I grew up here. This town supported me from the beginning. Um, you know, even Newmarket. I mean, I started skating in Newmarket. That's where I first put on skates and touched the ice for the very first time. Um, sad that rink is no longer there, but um, this place, this is my home. Even though I don't live in Richmond Hill right now, this is always, always my home. I always feel like going back to my grassroots area of where I grew up. This is, this is a, it's like an energy resurgence for me being here, and then representing Central Ontario. I couldn't think of any other place just because I, I, I loved training here. I loved skating for Ontario um, and it's there were so many I mean back when we had the different sections I liked the different sections because we're so big Ontario is massive it's and, huge and, and I know Central and Central had a lot of the top skaters because on the outskirts it's very hard to build the clubs very far away on those on those um, uh, the little outlying towns. areas yeah yep. the outlined areas very hard but they had a place which was great because you'd have the, the odd like the talents some of those talents would pop up and they'd come and they'd compete and and it was fun you know and it, i know it's hard now to have the one all in one although i gotta tell you a couple of cool things ontario now represents 40 percent of the country skaters are from ontario well, and yeah. we are hashtag champion ontario all the national champions come from ontario yeah it's pretty i'm I'm not surprised. There's just yeah. a lot. I mean, it's but just, it's a huge area, right? And there's heart in every part of the province, but there are different areas to be sure. Yeah, absolutely. I remember th even back in the day, we always had. Well, Kurt was from Edmonton and and, and that area, 
you know, Rocky Mountain House and, and uh, Mike Slipchuk and all the guys. I remember it was, there was like some good ones from Vancouver and, and Alberta and then it was all, you know, we wouldn't see each other until nationals because we would always fight it out with the, the Quebec team, yeah. which was always very strong. They always had a really good pack of skaters and, and it was uh, always fun at divisionals to kind of get through and get to nationals. But um, I miss those days. Those days were fun. Well, you know what? This has been just a delightful conversation that I thought we'd only be able to chat for about 10 minutes, but when has that ever happened with us? It worked out awesome. <laughs> anyway, sorry Facebook Live, but this is going to be on YouTube. And Elvis Stoiko, thank you, thank you, thank you. You've been an awesome skater in residence. Um, people check out all of his blogs, all of his everything, and uh, we're going to follow you on television and parts beyond. Cool.